All right, hello everybody. Go ahead and get started here. Uh, well, again, hello. My name is Savannah Pinnell and I'm the Curatorial and Collections Paraprofessional here at the Fine Arts Center. And first, I'd just like to thank you all for making the time to come out on this Saturday afternoon and to be in this experience with us to get to have this lovely opportunity to hear from the artist Delilah Montoya. Uh, first, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement that was written by Colorado College's elder in residence, Debbie Howell. Colorado College occupies the traditional territories of the Nuchu, known today as the Southern Ute Tribe, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, and the Northern Ute People, who lost their beloved homelands due to colonization, forced relocation, and land theft. Other tribes have also lived here, including the Apache, the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Comanche, and notably continue to do so, along with many other indigenous people. To actively seek social justice, we acknowledge that the land continues to hold the values and traditions of the original inhabitants and caretakers of this land. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, elders, and youth, past, present, and future. Today's artist talk in response to our current exhibition, Where the Saint Lives, that I curated uh, with the support of the, our incredible museum team. This exhibition examines works produced in the southwestern United States and Mexico, spanning from the 1800s to the early 2000s, that make visible the link between cultural identity and spirituality. Through the process of doing research for this exhibition, I had the incredible opportunity to meet and work with Delilah Montoya, whose photo mural, La Guadalupana, is featured in this show. Today and tomorrow are the last days so to see this exhibition, so I'd love to encourage all of you to go check it out if you haven't had the chance to do so yet. And now it's my honor to introduce to you all Delilah Montoya. Delilah Montoya is a self-identified Chicana artist who works and lives in the US Southwest of New Mexico and Texas. As an activist artist, she poses herself questions about identity, power, land, borders, gender, community, family that she then explores through her art practice. She's an investigator of histories and lives. Her primary subject is the human condition through time and territory as expressed through the lens of being Mestiza, a Chicana, someone who claims a hybrid identity and place in both terms of lineage and culture. Delilah's work is in the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Houston Museum of Fine Art, the Mexican Museum in San Francisco, the Bronx Museum, and the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. Her awards include the USLAF Latinx Fellowship, Art Audia Award, and the Richard T. Castro Distinguished Professorship. She is a professor emeritus from the University of Houston College of Arts. I do also just want to let everyone know that we are recording this talk, and we will have time for questions afterwards. And now I'll hand it over to Delilah. Hello, and it's wonderful to be here in Colorado Springs. We used to pass by Colorado Springs all the time getting to Las Vegas, New Mexico. Uh, when I was a kid, my mother and, and my family lived in Omaha, in Omaha, Nebraska. Kind of got stuck out there, but she was always homesick. So in the, spring, in the summertime when we were out of school, she would pack us all up in our car and she would drive all day and part of the night to get home, right? So we would come past Colorado Springs and I remember seeing the, the mountains and it, I knew that we were getting close to home when we saw the mountains, right? And then we'd go through all of that blank peri, prairie land, Yano. You know about that, Monica. <laughs> Until finally, Wagon Mound, right? <laughs> Springer, and then Las Vegas, and finally we made it home. It was generally two o'clock in the morning. And in Las Vegas, New Mexico, they never locked doors. So we would just kind of like open the door, and my grandmother would get up, and they'd start building a fire, and everybody started talking, and everybody got happy, and, and um, usually we didn't sleep that night. <laughs> and not until the next day. So yeah, Colorado Springs was just a smell of almost getting back to Las Vegas. So I'm Delilah Montoya, 
And uh, as I said, it's just really a delight to come here to speak with you. And I would like to um, thank Savannah Pinnell for bringing me to Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center and at the Colorado College and for curating La Guadalupana into the exhibition Where the Saints Live. And if you haven't had a chance to see it, you, don't, you have about this much time left because it's going to close by tomorrow. Um, working with Savannah, it's been a pleasure. She has been really encouraging and she kind of encouraged me to take a step that I probably wouldn't have taken. So I thank you for that. La Guadalupana has been exhibited extensively as well as included in to two traveling exhibitions, Only Skin Deep, Changing Visions of the American Self, hosted by the International Center of Photography in New York, and that was curated by Coco Fusco. And Imágenes y Historia, Chicana Altar-Inspired Art, and that was hosted by the Atkman Arts Center in Tufts University in um, Massachusetts. It's been published and reviewed in a number of publications, such as Secret of Survival by Sandra Matthews, Behold the Natural Affinity by Victor Alejandro Sorrell, and Looking Through the Eye of the Goddess, Delilah Montoya's photo insta installation, La Guadalupana, by Asta Kunensin in Chicana, Chicano Art, Critical an Anthology, 2013. Three versions of this installation have been produced. The Museum of Fine Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico purchased the smaller nine-foot version, and Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts purchased the 11-foot installation. Those installations are now, now part of their permanent collection. The third version was produced 24 years later, here, now, for the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center. So, yes, 24 years later, we um, brought her back to life. I would like to share some insights concerning the inspiration and creation of La Guadalupana. The installation was conceived for the international show Ida y Vuelta, 12 New Mexico artists. It opened in Rodez, France, at the Musée Bouche de Nice in June of 1998. Lawrence, the curator, asked that I construct an installation dedicated to the Guadalupe. Oh, let me move this. There we go. Okay. Um, dedicated to the Guadalupe. Her intent was to provide a visual dialogue that bridged New Mexico and Rodez's community together. The show was organized by Francisco Benitez, a very gifted oil painter from Santa Fe, whose wife had ties to Rodez, France. And so that was one of the ways in which, you know, I was able to get to France because they wanted to kind of like create this bridge of communication. Interestingly, the community of Rodez was familiar with the Guadalupe as a religious relic. The Basilica in the town's central plaza housed a niche that was dedicated to the Guadalupe. It housed a 17th century easel painting that a Franciscan missionary monk brought back from Mexico. And I went to France for the install and opening. I was pretty excited about that. Whew. Um, and I, I uh, well, what you can see is I stay, do you see that basilica right here? Do you see, let's see if I can get this right there. That was the apartment that I stayed in, right, right there at the top. So that was like pretty exciting. When I saw this image, I was like, yes, I remember that. Beautiful basilica, isn't it? It's gorgeous. And this right here was the actual easel painting that was brought back. And at that time, I was working at Hampshire College in Massachusetts, and my granddaughter was two years old, right? And my grandson was actually on the way. So that, that's one of the wonderful memories that I have about that period of time. Grandchildren are amazing, aren't they? They really are. Okay. 
Okay, my interest was to introduce the image as a cultural icon concerning the Chicano vernacular. The intent was to reveal the underpinnings of colonialism. That is the dark side that foregrounds captivity, oppression, and servitude. As part of the Chicano collective consciousness, the Guadalupe signifies a syncretic relationship that expresses both European and American native thought. This cultural mixing, or mestizaje, echoes the Chicano spirit. So one of the things that I was really interested in at that period of time, and I'm still interested in, is to kind of create what I think about the Chicano aesthetic, right? And just begin to think about all of the nuances that inform us as to who we are as a community, and then just really kind of dive into that and just try to understand it better in terms of history, in terms of my own culture, and in terms of how I feel about that particular icon or image. These Guadalupe tattoos being shown are part of a series that I was preparing as for the study for La Guadalupana installation. Some of the colored studies that were used for the central image, did it just move by itself? It did. Okay, let me put it back. There we go. Um, for some of the colored uh, studies were used to frame the central image. Within the Chicano community, La Guadalupana functions not only as a sacred symbol, um, but also as kitsch reproductions. The images are reproduced in many ways, such as um, in tattoos, on t-shirts, on candles, even holograms. I actually shipped those cactus that are embedded with the virgin that you see to France. So these got shipped. And guess what? Customs didn't pull them out. <laughs> they, they made it through customs, and so I was really, really happy with that. As I was doing the studies, I made a list as to where I might find people with Guadalupe tattoos, and I knew I wanted to use a tattoo, right? That was what I was specifically looking for. And one of the places I decided was um, boxing gyms. And I thought about Luis Tapia. I don't know if everybody knows who Luis Tapia was, but he was a boxer. He was a really well-known boxer in New Mexico. And I knew he had virgins tattooed on him. So I started looking really close at pictures started trolling him, right? <laughs> and I found, and you know, he had virgins, but he didn't have a Guadalupe. And I was thinking, oh my God, he would have been amazing, right? To blow up 10 feet, he would have loved it. Well, you, you know, Luis Tapia, he would have loved that, right? But uh, he had the wrong virgin, so I had to let that one go. <laughs> Ultimately, with the help of Cecilio Garcia Camarillo, I was able to locate an inmate at the Albuquerque Detention Center. That was because Cecilio was working for the Mexican consulate. And at the Mexican consulate, a lot of the like, caseworkers would go into the prisons to help the Mexican nationalists go back across the border or kind of help them out with um, human rights issues. And he was connected with uh, with a prison counselors. And I had asked him to ask them if were there any Guadalupe tattoos in the prison. And he goes, do we have tattoos? <laughs> do we have Guadalupe tattoos? But one of the things that I could not find that was on my list at that time in 1998 was a Guadalupe tattoo on the back of a Latina. So I drew it. <laughs> um, eventually, and I drew it on my cousin Darlene's back. So at that time, there were very few Latinas that sported uh, tattoos. It was not a thing back then, like it is now. I think I could probably find one now, whereas I couldn't at, at that time. Considering the countless generations that have constructed altars to Our Lady Guadalupe in hopes their prayers are heard, I believe this validates her as an integral part of the Chicano collective consciousness. And so that was another thing that I was interested in. What is the Chicano collective consciousness? 
and why do these icons that we have tend to persist? Okay, so those were some of the questions I was asking myself. Okay, so these studies are photographed using an 8x10 camera. So an 8x10 camera is a large format camera. It's kind of like those old time cameras that you see where people put like a cover over their heads, like that. And with the intent to blow the oversized negative up to a 10-foot um, chemical photograph, uh, photographic mural, I know that a large oversized negative would hold amazing detail and it would resonate as a massive projection that draws the viewer into the image. Once I saw inmate Felix Martinez, who you see here, virgin, I knew that his back broached my conceptual intent concerning the Guadalupe. So everything was there. The idea of servitude, the idea of incarceration, all of that was right there within the, the prison system. In 1998, I selected this final study to be enlarged 20 times its original size by gridding the negative into 42 sections. Then each section was printed on a separate sheet of photographic paper with the C print study, which is those colored photographs that you see, bordering the central image. Finally, the rendition was mounted on foam core installed on the wall with Velcro tape. So it was a process, right? It was kind of a mosaic. On the right is the first installation as seen in France at Musée Pouche de Nice in 1998. The rendition, which this particular rendition, is owned by Williams College in Massachusetts. And the way I can tell the difference is because it's not square. Right, do you see up there on the top where you have that small roll? Okay, good, we're on the second one. Good timing. <laughs> Using a more a contemporary approach to rendering the photograph today, in 2022, the negative was drum scanned to a two gigabyte file. It was then printed by the Colorado College media staff member, Jonathan Dankenbring, right? on polyester substrate with a sticky back, and then he adhered it to the wall. And I thank him for doing an excellent job of installing the mur mural. Big thanks to Colorado Fine Arts Center. You did a beautiful job. And that's what she talked me into. I, I, pro I, you know, I was like fighting her at the beginning, like, ah, really, you want to do that? Mm, I don't know. Right? And then I got to thinking about, you know, she's right. You know, if I digitize that file and up to the scale, I can move it from one museum to the other without having to approach another collector, you know, collections to get it out of their collection. It would move easy, more easily. And I feel like this image really needs to be seen. Right? So, thank you. So this process is really a game changer for all the reasons that I expressed, that it actually, I can move the image so much easier. Okay. In 1997, Felix Martinez, the sitter whose back was photographed, was being held in the detention center in a waiting trial for a drive-by shooting. Most people assumed when looking at the photograph that he was a young man, but in reality, he was a 45-year-old veterano that is a gang member who has been spent most of his life in prison. He acquired the tattoo of the Guadalupe while incarcerated in California and then spent time in the New Mexico prison system. There he befriended Reyes Lopez Tijerina, a Chicano activist from the civil rights movement who worked with uh, land grants, particularly in Terra Amarilla. At the time of his release, he met Valerie. Valerie and Felix married, and Barbara Ann Destiny was born. They were living in the Albuquerque South Valley in a community where their families resided and where they called home. The area is a two-block strip that is considered to be the heart of gang activity. While on the outside, Felix was constantly being watched. Albuquerque Police Department considered him to be a habitual criminal. Being a veterano, the young gang members would approach him with their activities. According to his counselor, he was tired of the violence and desperately wanted to 
wanted something better for his new family, especially the child. When a drive-by shooting came down in the neighborhood, he was targeted by the police and picked up. The feeling was is that he probably did not do it, but as a veterano, he knew who did. The state was pressuring, pressuring him to point out the shooter. Felix's predicament was either to protect the gang member and take the rap, which meant serving more time, or put a halt to his vida loca. Serving more time had little appeal. Felix had so little left to give. A 45-year-old veterano is a novelty in the barrio. He wanted peace. He wanted to be with his woman and watch a little girl grow. Felix decided to go state evidence. But before he could testify, he was smothered with a pillow. Nobody saw or heard anything. It was the pillow. The pillow did it. As the story starts all over again, with a little girl left to make sense out of a world that is unsparing. With this experience, I began to understand how surrealism indeed exists in our reality. When Andre Breton declared Latin America as a surrealist continent, Frida Kahlo stated, it's our monstrous reality. From my biography excerpt in Women Boxers, The New Warriors, Ondine Chavoya writes how the death of Felix transformed the installation into sacred space. He writes, the image effectively channels the sacred and the profane and transforms the physical space of a prison cell into a sacred space and the body of the inmate into an ofrenda, which is an altar. In this instance, the paired relationship of saint and sinner has the capacity to transform the viewer from before the image into a penitent. So every time that you bow down in front of that altar to see all those little things, you become the penitent. This is the second rendition, slightly smaller, but part of the New Mexico Museum of Art collection. So this, I'd like to tell you how the second one was made. The story starts with Michael O'Shaughnessy. He's a publisher at Red Crane Press in Santa Fe. And he came to me. I was, I was at a party with Cecilio that the Mexican consulate was having in Santa Fe. And Michael O'Shaughnessy comes to me and says, Delilah, I didn't even know he knew me, right? Delilah, I don't ever want to hear that you could not get the shot that you wanted because you did not have the equipment. And he gave me his card. And I'm like, wow, he don't know who he's talking to because I'll take him up on that one. <laughs> right? And so I was able to get into the detention center, but I didn't have the equipment. So I called him up. I told him, I need the equipment. And he told me, come on down. And he opened up this you know, locker, and there was an 8x10 Sinar camera with lights, right? Amazing lens that looked like diamonds, and he just put it all in my car and told me, go. And I went, and I took it to the detention center, and we loaded it all into a, a laundry, like, basket, <laughs> so that we could get it up to the detention center. I had Mike Piotas with me, an aerosol artist, so that he could, like, touch up the back of that, because usually these old tats, they get kind of, like, uh, soft, right? And so I really wanted, I wasn't gonna have much time and I needed to get this thing done. And so while he's touching up the back, I'm putting the lights up together, setting up the camera, working as fast as I could. They bring him out, they bring Felix out. Right, I had actually met him a little bit earlier and asked him if, whether or not I could photograph his back. He was okay with it. Um, I paid him some money, told him I'd pay him more once everything was done and I brought it back from France. And so I'm like shooting his back. I shoot like one, two, three. I get off to the, like the tenth um, image, and all the lights go out. Right? There's no power, and I knew what I did. I knocked out all the power to the detention center. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I did. And so I just kind of stopped. I smiled, and you know, I go, ah, I gotta go now. <laughs> and so I rolled up everything. I left, and. And the image went to France. There was this one woman by the name of Eileen Brander. 
and she was at that time a curator at the New Mexico Museum and she saw the work and she says, I want to buy this. And I'm like, sure, <laughs> why not buy it? You know, but they always do these things. They, they always do these things. <laughs> they never, you know, like finish what it is that they, they want. And I get back to the stateside and I get a call from Mylene and she goes, I want to buy that piece. Yes but it's too big. Can you make it smaller? Because we can't get it on our walls. I had made it to for about 12 feet, because that's how high that ceiling was, or, or so I thought, but it wasn't. So I had to like slant one, the last piece <laughs> so it would fit. But anyway, she was saying, yes, we'll buy it. I made it. And who? guess who the benefactor was? Michael O'Shaughnessy. The, 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 yeah. He went ahead and, and, and purchased it for the New Mexico Museum. Is that not just the amazing story? Yeah. Also in 1998, I was invited to exhibit at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City by photographer and curator Frank Gimpaya. At that time, I was teaching at Smith College in Northampton and Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. I had just finished installing La Guadalupana in France. Let me just stop just real quickly to explain the difference between Guadalupana, Guadalupe, and Guadalupano. They're very similar words, but they all mean slightly different things. A La Guadalupana, Guadalupana is the veneration of people who are, are like, like venerating the Guadalupe, right? The Guadalupe, of course, is the Guadalupe, the, the icon itself. A Guadalupano is a, kind of a male order of men who venerate the Guadalupe. Usually they have Guadal the Guadalupe on their back and they're called Guadalupanos. Okay, so you have, there's three different distinctions there. So when I, I'm using these words, then that way you have kind of a better sense of what it is that I'm trying to say. So at the time I was, te okay, before I began teaching, let's say I was teaching, I, okay, I had just finished installing the Guadalupana in France. Uh, and to print this massive mural, I went through 100 sheets of 20 by 24 photographic paper and had a stack of outtakes, right? I decided to use some of those outtakes to construct um, this assemblage for the exhibition. Before I began teaching, I used to work as a medical photographer where I photographed forensics and had a chance to collect images of prison tattoos. Given that I was showing at uh, a criminal justice college, I felt this piece entitled Chewy gets nailed on the crossfire. Wasn't appropriate for this space. <laughs> I can see Monica laughed, right? So you, you understand what, that, what I'm saying there, right? Okay, so Chewy in, uh, is a, um, a short name for, for Jesus or Jesus, right? So when I say Chewy gets nailed in the crossfire, then I am talking was in reference to, excuse me, let me go back over here. Okay, so the title, Chewie Gets Nailed on the Crossfire, is in reference to three photographs where a cholo was shot in the back. And so, of course, Chewie is a nickname for Jesus, or Jesus, and yeah, I'm sorry, some bad morgue humor. <laughs> The room was, where I showed was a small alcove where I displayed the Guadalupe studies alongside with the assemblage. It was at that time I met and befriended the director of the Ford Foundation, Tomas Ival Frausto, and his partner Dudley Brooks. And at that point they became very good mentors for me throughout my career. Um, so that show was very kind of, for that reason, was very important towards my own um, professional development. This is a detail of another install that I did, and it's called um, the Guadalupe and Piel. 
It's a window installation at the Andrew Smith Gallery that I did in December of 2000. And as you know, December is kind of like the month of the Guadalupe. And this was in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I was asked by my gallery dealer, Andrew Smith, to construct a Guadalupe installation in his uh, storefront. At that time, I was exploring the limits of digital imaging. That is, learning to capture an image from a negative and then n n manipulate it in uh, Photoshop, in the Photoshop software. At times, I was asked, why do cholos tattoo the Guadalupe on their backs? And the Guadalupe en Piel is my response to that question. The intention was to take this powerful Guadalupe lore and frame it by evoking an intellectual response to this act. I started by photographing in the round a torso tattooed with a Guadalupe and then assembling it as a rollout. I began thinking of the Guadalupe as a bicultural icon that denotes not only the international Baroque response immersed in Catholicism, but references central parameters to Nahuatl thought. The apparition story is seemingly simple. On Saturday, December 9th, 1531, our mother first appeared to Juan Diego. She had a number of appearances. Okay, but her first appearance was uh, December 9th. An Aztec Nahuatl Indian and recent Catholic convert, she requested that a church be built in her honor at Teyepeyac, a sacred site dedicated to Tonantzin, the sinal sign or proof that Juan Diego had spoken to Guadalupe, or possibly our mother, Tonantzin, is her graphic appearance on his cloak, known as Timatli, or Tilma. Like the Guadalupe herself, the collective understanding of the Tilma has remained intact throughout the centuries and resonates in the consciousness of Chicano thought. So I'm really interested in trying to unpack what that thought is. The Guadalupe version that you see is on the back of the nine panel Guadalupe in Piel installation. So that's the back side. The tilma references cloth as a symbolic magical alteration of reality, if you think about how she appeared on the tilma, right? And a metaphor for the second skin. The first skin, of course, is nakedness, and the second skin conceals that state. In addition, for Nahuatl society, the second skin evokes the shispe totek pelade skin garment, which was presented to this Amerindian deity following sacrificial rituals in observance of military and fertility rites. So what you're looking at here, this is an image, is the lower portion of the installation and is printed on transparent mylar. It's entitled Earth Mother. Actually, this is Laura Aguilar's back, an inspired Latinx photographer and a very dear friend of mine's. We used to shoot together and help each other with our projects. The Shispetotec was considered the male equivalent to the earth and moon goddess, Donanzin. During the ritual, the youth to be filleted wears a mask made of skin that was considered to be the sacrificial earth mother, Donanzin. Interestingly, prior to the sacrificial filleting of the woman who represented the goddess, she wore a tima made of maguey. This act binds the tilma into the ritual practice associated with the Shispetotec. The tilma that Juan Diego was wearing when the Guadalupe miraculous image imprinted on fabric was made of maguey. Like the Guadalupe, the maguey is native to the Americas and is associated with the Nahuatl spirituality. The tilma was worn by Diego hangs to this day in Mexico City at the Basilica that was built at the request of Guadalupe and in her honor. It is believed without the Guadalupe lore, the bridge that the Spanish and Native American cultures, so this Guadalupe lore brought together the Spanish and Native American cultures, an absolute holocaust may have ensued. Her acceptance by the Catholic Church opened the door for the conversion of the First Nation 
by extending the spiritual views of both societies. With all this in mind, the contemporary tattooing of the Guadalupe on the backs of cholos is not an odd coincidence. That is, if one trusts the collective consciousness. This act, in many ways, is a ritual practice that is meant to provide protection against harm and also empower the cholo during conflicts. It is a protective symbol. In tattooing the Guadalupe's image on their backs, the ritualistic practice of wearing our our mother is referenced. In following the myth, the tattooed cholo can be thought of as the shispetotec, who is the male aspect of the nansin. This act binds together both the male and female energies of our mother. What you see is the both the front and back side of the Guadalupe and Piel installation in the storefront of um, Andrew Smith. The installation became fully awakened during daybreak and twilight when the lights in the window backlit the Earth Mother and illuminates the image with a warm glow while the ambient daylight clarifies the front surface. This moment between night and day speaks of the dual nature invested in Nahuatl thought concerning Napantla, the place in between where duality meets. In this case, the daybreak expresses the crack between night and day as the creative act that moves between the two worlds. Pressed on the white vinyl lettering onto the window is a poem composed by Alurista, a Chicano poet that was written specifically for the installation. It reads, Corazón colonizado como rosas blooms Guadalupe Tonantensin in Latinma de Nuestra Chicana Piel. And so, you know, a, like a brief translation, the colonized heart like blooming roses, Guadalupe Tonantensin in our Tinma is Chicano skin, the Chicana skin. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for that, Delilah. Um, I have a few questions to start us off, and then we'll definitely open it up for everybody else. <laughs> yeah, if anybody has any questions first, right off the bat, we can definitely do that. How much conversation did you have with Felix? Um, how much time did you have with him? And how much of his story did he relate to you during the photographic process? You know, that's an excellent question. Thank you for that question. Um, I, usually before I do any photographing, right, especially when it's something like this sensitive, I want to give myself a little bit of time with uh, my subject, right? And so I was asked if I could go and talk with him first before we, I even brought my camera, before I even, you know. And so we sat down and we talked and I explained what it is that I wanted to do. I explained why it is that I wanted to do this. I also told him that it would be shown in France, that it was specifically for a particular installation, and that I would be willing to pay him to, um, to photograph his back. And of course, at that time, you know, he had, I really didn't know the story, what it ha where he was, or I knew it was a drive-by, but I didn't know anything more than that. And he didn't reveal any of that with me. He never told me that he had a, you know, a little girl, I didn't know about um, uh, Valerie, you know, I didn't know any of those things, right? So I photographed him, and it wasn't until I got back from France that I wanted to give him the rest of his money, right? And then the counselor told me, well, I have bad news for you. You know, he was taken out in the detention center, and then he's the one who revealed all of the details to me. Yeah. So and it was at that point that I realized, like, you know, when you talk about colonization and you talk about the effects of the, of the colonized people, this is where all of a sudden the reality hit me. Like, this is it. This is exactly what we talk about, right? This is what we study about. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Did you give the money to the family? 
Yes, after that I did give the money to the family and then when I um, sold the piece, then I gave them some of the money that I got from the sale. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> she was, you know, in a really bad way at that point. Yeah. There any, yes? The, the photograph that you did, that you painted while you were on your niece's back and photographed in the desert, was that deliberately after you did it? For me, it echoes that, you know, the famous. Uh, yeah, you, you, you spotted it. <laughs> it was it was totally I was inspired by Itorvi and her image with that woman walking through the desert with the do, with a boombox. Yeah, you know, and it was like, you know, I loved the way the, the dress was and all that. So what I did was I asked my mom, she had a lot of fabric and I just asked her for the fabric, right? I can have your fabric, mom. You know, so when I went up there in the desert, I, you know, just kind of like fashioned it as best as I could around her. But we had already drew the Guadalupe on her back. I love it because it echoes, but it's not a, you know, you're not replicating. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I loved her work. I mean, you know, I totally looked at her work, and especially, you know, black and white, right? You know, the black and white images. Yeah, he spotted me. <laughs> he spotted it. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. You say in your um, brochure description that the symbol of Guadalupe can be, is dual. It's a duality that it can represent a symbol of resistance and the presence of colonization and the results of colonization. And on the other hand, can be a representation of protection. Given your interactions with people, what did the majority of people, how did they identify with the, with the image? <coughs> You know, that's, that's where I like to kind of think about the collective consciousness, because we, the way it's understood, you know, like on the surface, right, is with the ideas of, you know, Catholic or, or, or kind of like the Catholic response, right, to altars and, and that she's our, the Virgin Mary and all of this, right? But then if you start looking deeper into it and you begin to think about you know, um, the collective consciousness, I always see the collective consciousness as being, I know, I know like everybody has been on a really like busy, like roadblock, you know, like traffic jam, right? And as you finally get to that point where it begins to release, you assume that you're going to see a car accident. And sometimes there isn't one. Right? It's already been removed, it's been backed up for so long that every time a car slows down, right, it's continuing to slow down at that one spot. But you no longer have the car accident. That's the collective consciousness. People are slowing down at a particular spot, but the reason why they're slowing down gets lost. But they're slowing down. And so when I started thinking about the tet, too, on the back, on the skin, on the wearing of her, then I realized that, that um, Juan Diego was wearing her, right? And when somebody has a tattoo on their back, they're wearing her. So there's the collective consciousness. There's the slowdown. Now, why is he wearing her, right? And then that's when I went to the Shispetotec, because there was that whole issue of the wearing of Tonantinsin. And so it made sense, right? It, it was sensible to wear her, but they didn't know why, possibly, because of the collective consciousness, right? And so what I'm doing as an artist, see, that's one of the reasons I like being an artist, because if I was an anthropologist, I couldn't say that, <laughs> right? I couldn't say that because I would have to have more proof. But as an artist, you can be inspired and just say, like, I think it's this. Yeah, thank you. That was a really wonderful question. Are there any other questions? I was here in the beginning, I came a little late. Um, why were you infatuated and, and, and drawn, particularly to our native Guadalupe? What brought you to her? What, what brought me to her? 
Um, I was challenged. You know, basically I was challenged to put together an installation about the Guadalupe, right? And uh, it was going to be shown in France, and it was really interesting because all the other 11 artists could show their work. A curator went over there, they pulled the work, they decided this is, this is the piece that we want. And for me, what they did was they came to me and says, can you do an, because I'm a Chicana, can you do an installation on the Guadalupe? And I'm like, hmm, I want to make one where it just takes everything and turns it upside down. Right? And, and so that was kind of like my challenge. And, and I was also thinking about like if I'm taking this colonial image and I was really clear that it was a colonial image and bringing it back to the old world, what do I want to tell them? What do I want to say about it to them so that it puts it in their face, right? And what better way than making it 12 feet? <laughs> and it was really, you know, I kind of felt a little bit bad, not really, but a little bit bad because it was so large, it turned like all the large paintings into postage stamps. <laughs> Everybody's work looked like a little postage stamp. But, I mean, but that was, you know, I guess maybe that was kind of a bit of aggressive kind of attitude that I had, but I thought it was important, you know, and when I came across Felix is back in the detention center. It was at that point I knew that that was the image. That really was, you know, where my search was taking me. And of course, Cecilio Garcia, you know, he's the one that got me in there. Talk about layers and layers of the archaeology of this process and his story that just, you know, blows this thing up in incredible dimension. Yeah, that's. That's true. I mean, I, I, like when I found out that he had passed, it was at that point, I mean, I just sat down. I was like, my mind was just, I mean, how do you, how do you put that together, right? Yeah. It's, it's a, just a spiritual tragedy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. I think our mother Mary was there when Felix died. And I think she was the one that found him and felt like he's the one that was, was to represent her. And there was no other more significant representation than Felix Martinez. You know, because, you know, think about what they tell us about, you know, Christianity, there is the repentance. So right? It's a sacrificial death, for sure. A sacrificial death. Right. And one of repentance. And so therefore, you see the two working together, right? There's that syncretic relationship between Nawa and, and Catholicism and Christianity. They're not separate. Well, no, not quite. He had decided that he was going to give up the name because he wanted out. But they, the gang got into the prison system and took him out before he could say anything. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. I intentionally did that. Yeah, because I, I, if you notice, there were some other ones that I had taken of him that I was kind of showing you studies. He wasn't handcuffed, right? And so I, I kind of knew, like, the handcuffs had a, a real kind of heavy kind of symbolism, right? And so I had, I, you know, I did ask him. I mean, I was kind of like, ah, uh, do you think, ah, uh, do you think that, mm, we can put the handcuffs on? <laughs> and he was okay with it. He was totally okay with it. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Yes. Do you know what became of his uh, daughter and what kind of influence this might have had on her? Um, 
I did, you know, kind of reach back out to her, and um, she, at that time, she had a child, and she was um, going to the community college. And I, when I was talking with her and talking to her mother, it didn't sound like her mother had told her everything. So I was very kind of careful not to say much because that's not my place. Yes? Could you talk about, it, it's fascinating that you, uh, you described that you were a forensic photographer. Um, so could you talk about how you relate to your artistic practice versus or maybe along with that forensic photography kind of background? Do you see this as, do you see that background as in your practice, or do you see yourself as an artist kind of breaking away from the forensic? Which I, I, I just imagine it's so connected, it has to be accurate, it has to be connected to the world, whereas art may not. So, could you talk about that? Really? About my relation to forensics, you know, nobody has ever, well, I usually don't talk about my relationship to for, forensics, um, but in this case, I kind of had to, since, you know, it was kind of the title, and I had to kind of like really justify what it was that I was doing and why, why my mind went into that direction, right? Um, I'm going to tell you the truth. I didn't like forensics. It was really hard for me to do. Um, I know like, at one point I um, just stopped listening to news. I just wouldn't listen to it anymore because I did not want to know what I was going to be walking into the next day. I just, I just, you know, I didn't want to have that all night long thinking about like, you know, I'm going to see this little girl who was raped and I don't, I was going to see, you know, this, or I was going to see like car crashes and, you know, all, I, I just didn't want to know. Um, so I didn't, really didn't do that for very long. I did it for maybe, I would say about a year, and then I found somebody else to do it. <laughs> Just let them do it, I wasn't gonna do it. Uh, but what effect did it have on me? I realized that there's a lot of things that happen out there that we have no knowledge of. Because there was many things that I saw that wasn't even reported on, in the news. All right. And I found myself just kind of asking questions like, I remember there was one where this woman was just brutally killed by her husband. Brutally killed, right? And she was an older woman. He must have been an older man. And I'm thinking, I'm looking at her and I'm and I find myself wanting to, you know, like talking to her, saying like, at what point did you realize that you should have left? At what point in your life? Right? And, and you know, so when I got like that, I was like, ah, I've got to get out of here. <laughs> you know, this isn't working for me. Yeah. So I would say what it did help me inform is that there is a need to know. You know, and that's one of the things that I like to do with my work is just kind of create knowledge. I think knowledge is very important and very powerful. Yeah. Yes. So, and my interpretation of it is like there's a bit of irony that's represented um, because he, he, he served his time um, and then he was brought back. Um, and then within the eyes of the law, to decide to, to give up that hand would be a form of repentance, and yet he was in an impossible situation. Do you feel like that um, is something within the interpretation that, that you focus on? Because um, that, that irony brings up kind of the collective consciousness and those chains and the social ramifications. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, I can do that now. Um, it, it was kind of a long one, but I think I got it. So there's irony there. You know, here we have Felix, right? He's trying to get out, right? He's already served his time. He's ready for a new life. He's starting a new life, right? And he gets drawn back in again. He gets pulled back in, right? And so then the irony is, is that in, in many ways, like, to reveal who did it would be like his penance. 
right? But before he can have his penance, right, he's kind of taken out. He's not able to, to do his penance. So that's the irony. And I would say that it happens a lot. I think the colonial process is kind of froth with that sort of experience. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why you see Frida Kahlo saying it's our monstrous reality. It's, it's the stuff that we've had for centuries to like swallow. <laughs> You know, just just kind of swallow that and move on. The salient point that you mentioned is that the cops knew he did not do it, and they took him in precisely to snitch to put him there. Right. That's the colonial system. That's the colonial system. They knew, and they so. were responsible. They ever they had a the kill. The cops were responsible. The system was. Absolutely. This blood is on their hands. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's the colonial process because they didn't see him as another human being who had repented, who was ready to start another life. He, they weren't giving him that opportunity. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's why, you know, this image just, just you know, speaks of the ideas of colonialism and we see the repercussions of colonialism. And at the time when I was doing this, I didn't think it was going to get that graphic. That was not the intention. I thought I'd go back, he'd see his picture over in France and big blow up and you know, he'd be happy. I'd give him a catalog and you know, give him some money and, and, and it just fell apart. Not only did they not protect him, they didn't care enough about his life and his, you know, his person, his identity. His family? Exactly. They couldn't. I mean, that's the other irony. Even if they wanted to, they couldn't because this, the prison system is not run by the, by the system itself, right? Well, and I don't know the background story either. I don't know if somebody got paid off. I don't, you know, we just don't know. All right, that was never revealed. Yes? Like, in so many ways, you become the steward, the caretaker of Phyllis's story. And I wonder if, if that shapes anything about ways you engage with, with other um, folks that you're individually in. Yeah, it, you know, it, it absolutely does. Um, I did a whole photo shoot with, um, I call uh, Nuestra Senor, um, I call it um, Contemporary Casta Portraiture, Nuestra Calidad. And I photographed all of these families and DNA tested them and all of that. So when I was photographing them, right, I didn't have them sign any model releases. Right? And it's only when I get the image that I want to use and get it done the way that I like it that I show it to them and then ask them to sign a model release. Because I feel that a person has to have, you know, governance over their own images. Right? I don't, I don't put anything out unless somebody, unless I get the model to feel okay with it. They have to feel okay with what the work that I do because it's 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 their image, right? And it's you know it's the only I think respectable thing to do. Yeah. Yes. Have you actually taken a picture of the original? What do you mean a picture of Mexico in Mexico City? No, I haven't even seen it. <laughs> it's on my bucket list. It's on my bucket list. I'll have to go down there and, and, and take, a, take a look at it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've read a lot about it. I've, you know, I've seen pictures, all of that. Anybody here has seen the... Yes? Yeah, tell me about it. about 40 pictures of her and then I picked the best one. So it was amazing. Yeah, 
so so is there on a tilma? It's a, does it, it's a tilma. They weren't lying to me, were they? <laughs> it's a tilma made of mage, a Native American cloth, a Native American shawl. Still just the cyber. That's the amazing part. It's really, really awesome. And there it is. You can't separate one from the other, right? It's, it's joined together. A fiery join, but it's joined together. Okay, one, one more question? No? What are you personally working on? Building an art house. Wow. <laughs> I have a, a home in, in Albuquerque, I just retired, and I have this really amazing little piece of property and I want to build a little art house uh, where I can make work the way I want, as slow as I want to do it, um, without any pressures, and invite my friends to come in and, and make work and, and just, just turn it into an art house. So I'm, kind of, I'm working on that right now. Um, and then also with um, the contemporary cast of portraiture, I'm, I'm kind of doing a little bit of marketing with that. I have ideas that I would like to start working on, but you know, I can't do that until I get a, a good studio to work in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>